So what we have here is a couple of Sharp CE-158 uh, serial and parallel interfaces for the PC-1500 slash 1600. I also believe it'll fit. Uh, this is the official Sharp version. You know, it has uh, RS-232 and parallel. This is the Radio Shack version, the 26-3612. It only has the RS-232. So it's missing one extra board uh, in here. As you can see here, this has an extra board. Makes it a little more difficult to work on. Both of these have failures. Uh, but this one is kind of interesting. I wasn't planning on doing a video about it, but I thought, well, this is kind of an interesting problem. So why not? It might be fun to share. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this episode. They offer an excellent quick turn PCB prototyping service, which now has a free upgrade to the 150-160 temperature range. They also offer a wide range of services that allow you to go from idea to a finished product, including CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, PCB assembly. Go on over to pcbway.com OEM to find out more. So what happens if you plug this into the computer and you turn the computer on, the computer comes on for a split second and shuts right back off. I'll have to sign right away that something big is wrong. So quit trying to plug it into the computer. You don't want to damage the computer. Um, so this normally runs off a 4.8 volt battery pack like this, which plugs into here. I've got a couple leads on here. It's going to my bench power supply as a power switch. But this power switch is not the whole story. If we look at the schematic here, uh, this section is just the power input, reverse polarity protection, that type of thing. This section right in here is low battery detection. And this section actually controls power on. You notice it says VCC right here. Well, that comes from the computer. So no matter what position you have this switch in, this thing will not turn on. You have to apply uh, 4.7 volts from the computer. Uh, that will turn on this transistor, turns on these transistors, and then we enable the DC to DC converter here, which generates minus nine volts, nine volts, and then it'll generate its own five volts off of positive nine volts it's kind of clever thing sharp did there so uh, even if you actually leave the power switch on this thing on it will not actually stay on so we can see here we've got VCC coming from the computer and it is going to the various ICs in here so I have a clip here going to the 5 volt input on the, the serial interface chip which is an RCA part, a CDP1854 ACE. And the other part of the RS-232 that is of interest is these two chips right here, which are the buffers that give you the, the higher plus and minus voltage. So this chip talks to these two chips with regular, you know, zero to five-ish volt levels, and these chips then convert that to either plus nine or minus nine using the output of the DC to DC converter. So uh, the symptoms are if I power this uh, through the, the VCC as though it was the computer uh, without it turned on, it'll draw about 10 milliamps. So we've got all the chips running like they should be, uh, except these two guys have don't have the higher voltage applied to them and everything's fine. If we flip the switch on, uh, we'll get a few amps uh, flowing through the five volts. So something is definitely wrong. The uh, UART chip here starts getting a little warm, but remember the warm chip might not be the bad chip. If it's trying to drive these two guys and there's a problem here, uh, it might be doing its best to drive the load on these and that's why it's getting warm. So 
that's a distinct possibility. So I'll show you the symptoms here and then I'll describe uh, how we'll go about trying to work on this. So here's our test setup. I've got the bench power supply set to 5 volts with a 100 milliamp limit just to be safe. And if I take the fly lead right here, uh, switches in the off position, and I touch to the 5 volts, we get. Eck. About 10 milliamps flowing. So all our logic chips on here and the UART and everything um, seem to be okay. They're not doing anything funny or drawing too much current. Now, if we flip the switch to on, you'll see that we'll jump up to. Uh, about 113 milliamps it's limiting it dropped down to 3.6 volts so something's going wrong here so what we need is a way of isolating the uh, minus 9 and plus 9 volts from the rest of the system uh, I didn't want to just go ahead and pull those two buffer chips out uh, if you desolder things, you always take a risk of damaging a pad. So, you know, try to do the least amount of work to find the information you need. So I pulled up one leg of each of these two rectifier diodes right here, which you can see right here. So we won't get our minus and plus nine out. We won't be generating five volts from here, but it should let everything else run. Uh, we won't get the feedback here from our minus five either. I'm not sure if that'll cause a problem, but there was no other way to isolate that circuit. So we'll see what happens. Um, we can see in this state, if we get that overcurrent condition, if we don't, then we can reconnect these diodes one at a time through a current meter to see which side the current is being gobbled up by. My suspicion is the negative side I don't know why that's just my suspicion but we'll see what happens power supply on five volts on and our, our switch is in the off position here so I'm going to touch the green lead here to the five volts Again, we have our 10 milliamps. Now I will turn the switch on. And we still have our huge current draw. Hmm. So maybe that means that uh, this guy talking to these two guys is causing the problem. I'm not sure. So I guess the only way really to be sure now is to pull up these chips one at a time and see what happens. So uh, we pulled up one end of each of these diodes, which are our rectifiers right here. And that didn't help us. And thinking about that some more, that made sense to me because uh, this line past this diode on the negative uh, line here is our feedback which helps regulate the voltage. It goes through this diode and through a, a 10 volt zener into this pair of transistors. So I thought well before diving into our buffer chips maybe I should look at the primary side of the switching power supply. Uh, so these are those two transistors uh, here and here and I couldn't test those in circuit so I pulled them out they tested fine. Uh, likewise, these two diodes are right here. I had to pull one leg up on each of those to test it, and they were fine. Checked all the resistors. That was fine. Uh, checked the wiring through the transformer, which is shown here. All that seemed okay. And I was kind of puzzled, and I thought, well, I'll solder in all the parts I'd taken out for testing and uh, check to see if the DC to DC uh, converter was oscillating because if it's in a fixed state if it's just turned on if these transistors are turned on they're basically going through like a, a low ohm short right here and that might put a big load on the battery uh, so I noticed that it was oscillating fine which surprised me and in fact it worked 
I was getting plus and minus 9 volt out and 5 volt and what the heck was going on. Uh, thinking back about what I did when I was removing some of these parts, I had to move some of these bodge wires out of the way, or you know, both of these. I guess there's only two on this side here. And they were kind of intricately wound in through some of the leads. And I looked, and right here on this one, there was a bare spot. I've been rubbing up against something over in this area. Um, so I put some cat tan tape under here and then taped them down with cap tan tape uh, to keep them from moving around and maybe causing that problem again. Then I got curious, well, what in the heck are these wires doing? And there's a couple bodge wires here too with some funny heat shrink. So in measuring this, found out these are diodes in here and pin 22 of the UART and pin five and six of the 40H368, which is uh, an inverted uh, copy of the serial output of the UART. Those are diode or together and they go to pin 11 of the DB25 for the serial output, which is odd. And from our LH511 IO chip, it goes through a 2.2K resistor to pin 18 of the DB25. Now those aren't usually uh, used for anything. And these are five volt signal levels uh, not RS-232 levels, so I have no idea why this would have been modified this way. Um, I looked at this sharp version, and it was not modified this way, and I thought, well, maybe this is something, you know, the original user of this did, although it didn't look used. I don't know. And I had one other uh, Radio Shack version of this, and I took it apart, and lo and behold, it has the same modifications, except it actually has pads for the diodes. It's got places for the jumper wires to be soldered, and they use the same type of candy cane looking wiring they did other places. And it also has pads over here for the jumper wires on this side. So I don't know if this is something they added to later units to only the Radio Shack version, which does not have the parallel port. I, I don't know what these wires are for. It kind of baffles me. But at any rate, we got this one fixed. Uh, it was just a shorted bodge wire. So I'll put this back together enough we can plug it into a uh, computer and check that it all works. So I've got a PC1500A hooked up to the serial interface, which is off screen here. I'm going to turn the serial interface on. Then the computer. I get no errors, which is good. That means they're talking to each other. Now I'm going to set the communication parameters with setcom. This is a, a basic command that comes as part of the ROM on the serial interface. Setcom 2400, 8 comma in comma one just like you'd expect i am going to turn on uh, or connect a cool term which i have running on the pc and then on the computer i will do out stat zero which sets the handshaking lines you can see we now have dsr and dcd lit up on cool term and now we're going to redirect the cassette input routine through the serial interface with set dev ci enter and then we will do c load a lowercase a that says load it as an ascii file And I will press enter and then do connection, send text binary file, my test file, and open. And it's done now and we should be able to list. Oops, gotta go back to uppercase characters. List, there we go. We've got our program in there. So, uh, it's a relatively simple problem on the serial interface. Um, 
just had a bodge wire shorted out and the question comes what is that bodge wire for? If you have any ideas I would love to know. I'm sorry.